What's up, y'all? This is episode 57 of the Avian Behavior Podcast, and this is the first time we've actually done a visual podcast. So usually I'm like in my guest room surrounded by towels and pillows and just like talking into the microphone, but you know, we're leveling up. So this is a uh, behavior makeover, one part of our behavior makeover series, and this is like a public edition. So sometimes we have public and sometimes it's just for members inside the lab. And I thought this would be a really special one because we are like talking about ne non-coercive negative reinforcement with a non-releasable raven. So it's a pretty common situation. Also just for like wildlife rehabs or parrots that are showing a lot of fear and escape and, or avoidance responses. And that's really just really prevalent in uh, just all kinds of scenarios, but also we're going to be talking a lot about it during Avocet, our conference at the end of March that you can sign up for still. And also we have our free behavior challenge that you can sign up for and you can do this like with mentored feedback live. And it's also an evergreen challenge. That's my cat right there. And so that's going to be right before Avocet because we're just like getting geared up, getting excited, talking about these principles. And also I will say talking about these principles in really just palatable terms. So that's really important to me is breaking down this science in a way that you can understand it. So uh, yeah, you can sign up for that and you can do so uh, in the show notes. You can do so in the caption here on YouTube. And yeah, so enjoy this conversation. We're going to be running some B-roll uh, of our work with our ravens and you can just kind of see the evolution of our work with that so sometimes we're using counter conditioning when nowadays we would be not using counter conditioning we would be using non-coercive negative reinforcement and then you can also see uh where we pulled out from our free lofted eagle course with our ornate hawk eagle that we that's when we really first started using non-coercive negative reinforcement so we popped that in here too and you can find that course on the lab if you are a member so here we go okay so we have Anne here and we're going to be working our behavior makeover this is an interesting one i think because this is one that we haven't gotten to do publicly for our behavior makeover series, or a, a similar one, I should say. And so I'm going to read what Anne sent in. We're going to go over briefly anything else that you might want to add, Anne, and then, okay. uh, and then we'll just kind of get to it. So let's see, we have... Uh, due to a wing injury, this bird is unable to fly. He is a, a non-releasable raven. And is that that's all correct, right? We got that all? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So he was given to her by a wildlife rehabber colleague. He is an adult. Uh, she has had him for about four months now. He is a, in a good-sized enclosure with lots of varying perches of different heights that he hops onto readily. He eats well. I click every time I put food down. I have not yet tried to make friends, quote, or do any training other than clicking when I put food and water down. He has become less afraid of my presence, but will not come near me. He is very wary of novel items. My attempts at environmental enrichment in the form of food dispensers or hiding food in anything gets no attention from him at all. I would like to find out what I can do to make his life more interesting and suggestions on how to begin training him to come to my arm. I would love to be able to do educational work with him at some point. No biggie if I cannot. I am very familiar with positive reinforcement, CPD. TKA as a former dog trainer, as well as using it with all animals at the nonprofit donkey and mule rescue I founded in 2017. Thank you for your consideration. All right. Awesome. Okay. So the first place I like to start is that, uh, well, and you did talk about some of your goals um, that you have with him. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about uh, short-term versus long-term. So we got your long-term is like hop on mm -hmm. arm, go to educational programs. Of course. In fact, I just had this conversation actually today with one of my staff members at the very beginning of our day is like, you know, like, uh, sorry, what, you know, just getting that goal, like having that goal in our heads is great, mm -hmm. but you know, like, let's keep, it's always good to keep it in mind, but let's like, let's look at like a short-term goal. So tell me what it looks like, like, what does success look like to you in like 
uh, 14 to 30 days. What does that look like? Okay, um, and uh, just one typo I might have made. I started the rescue in 2007, not 17, not that it matters, but I've been doing it for a while. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I might, have, matter, I might have said something, I might have right. misread it. So yes, right. it doesn't okay. matter. Him, what I would like for him is to be comfortable in my presence, first of all. Um, okay. Right now, there is a, uh, I had a different type of bird in the enclosure before that had a little, well, a big, it's probably a four foot high, um, cage house that I left in there because I have to disassemble it to take it out. And he uses that to perch on. And that's where he eats. He takes all his food up there to eat. And he has enough room to get behind it. So that's whenever I enter the enclosure, that's where he goes behind it. Um, he will eventually come out and sit on the top and stay there for a minute or two with me in the enclosure. What I basically want right now is for some sort of environmental enrichment. Mm -hmm. uh, anything I put in, he's really afraid of new items. Um, like I've used treat ball, dog treat balls and things you can stuff food into. Um, I've put shiny CDs in there and he wouldn't even go near his food dish when the CDs came in. So I kind of hid those behind something else. Um, so my, ba my first goal, I think, would just have him be comfortable with my presence. Okay. Okay. Okay, and I, that I think that's a, a very good goal. So it's interesting because this is actually just the topic of uh, the the content that we have in our newsletter uh, that's going to be coming out tomorrow. So this is like right, like just like right in our <laughs> wheelhouse of what we're going to be talking about. And in fact, I mentioned I don't know if I mentioned in the newsletter, but I know we talk about it is um, I mentioned, you know, how difficult Corvids can be about this particular, this particular concept, because okay. it's just, this is, this is part of what they do is, um, is having, you know, sensitivities to novel objects. So mm -hmm. you do have your work cut out for you. And one of the biggest things that I, I like to go about it a couple of different ways. So here Oops. we go. I'm just kind of rolling up the sleeves here. Yep. So, <laughs> so I like to go about it a couple of different ways. So yes, I do agree that sort of gently kind of getting him accustomed to uh, different things in his environment is definitely going to take you a lot further and him being able to kind of have some skills, build some curiosity, learn how to, I like to say like, push buttons. And really mm -hmm. what that is, is just seeking behavior. So he learns, you know, just how to, how the routine kind of works. It's like, oh, if I do this, then this sort of predictable thing will happen. So like sure. if I forage in this item, then I know certain things will happen. And that's kind of that object permanence, right? In 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 metaphorically speaking, but also in all kinds of different ways. So the way that he understands that you can also provide predictable uh, forms of value, even though he can't see it right now. Does that make okay. sense? It does. And I hide mealworms. He's got little piles of logs and stuff like okay. that, that he could poke around in. And I do put mealworms in those areas and he will go after those and find the worm. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Good, good, good. Okay. So we've already got some beginnings of that going. We just need to make sure that they look maybe a little bit different than logs. So that he can kind of understand that. So the okay. first, so there's a few different ways that overcoming those fear responses can happen. And I'm kind of, kind of, this is like fresh off of my mind because I, um, actually, one sec, here, I can even upload some videos that I took literally just today. And oh, um, it's kind of funny. They're just basic videos, but um, I'll upload them really quickly while I'm sitting here talking. So you can Thank kind you. of see the basics of what I'm looking at. And it's with a raven, um, oh, no wow. less. So, <laughs> <Timing> is <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, okay. So I'm just going to do a couple of things at once here. But, uh, okay. So, so there's a couple of different ways that birds, uh, individuals, I guess, will... So we have, of course, we have flooding. And, uh, you know, that is just really yeah, like, put, exactly, I'm just going to put it out there just so that people kind of understand. Okay. And, and we're just kind of have this sort of spectrum of what we're talking about. And, and sometimes flooding happens, whether we realize it or not. So it's just important to understand kind of 
what the spectrum is. So flooding is when there's a stimulus presence that invokes a fear response. The animal cannot get, or the individual cannot escape it and avoid it and just sort of learns like, okay, fine. It's just here. And this is, this is where we're at sort of thing. So that's flooding. I always like, in fact, I mentioned uh, in the newsletter, like fear factor is like sort of in my yeah. mind, like that is flooding and what happens is is that we often have spontaneous resurgence so even when the bird shows uh or the i i'm gonna just say bird <laughs> um because okay, yeah, that's, that's... <laughs> that's where we're at so even when the animal shows somewhat you know calm behavior around that stimulus like okay fine he's gotten over it it can you know just the fear response can re can resurge later on down the line at some point we don't okay. really know when so there's that and then we have habituation. So habituation is kind of like when we have we when we want to have like a neutral response to something and the bird learns to like filter it out. It's not that big of a deal. I think of like cars, you know, ambient activity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we get that uh, or we get, you know, that sort of hypersensitive response with birds that do come from rehab in some situations, or I often call it like birds that are raised in really sort of um, sterile environments or, or any mm -hmm. animal actually, but that's why socialization in dogs and horses is so important. I'm a horse girl. I, I, yeah. I, I speak the language, but just letting them sort of gently become accustomed to ambient uh, environments is well, so important. Thing. We're good there because he's here's the donkeys saw the mules all day long. Exactly. And he's situated on our driveway, which is a circular driveway. So cars come and go and our woodshed is right next to where he is on one end. And he's okay with people going in and out of there. He doesn't freak out anymore. He may pop up to his top of his cage. He may stay behind, but he, he seems to be okay with that now. Wonderful. Wonderful. Great. I love it. Um, okay. So yeah, then that's habituation. Some people, I would say there are some people that use habituation along with some other procedures like a systematic desensitization where we might leave, let's just say, let's call it like a toy or a foraging item that mm -hmm. might evoke a strong fear response and they leave it kind of in the area and they let them get used to it and then they bring it closer and then they bring it closer. That's not exactly habituation, but it's somewhere in the family in between that and uh, systematic desensitization. So okay. that brings us to sy systematic desensitization where again, we're putting something that evokes a fear response in the animal's visual field, let's just say, or in their sensory field, yeah. something that you know, if it's a bird, we say visual. If it's a dog, it could be any, you know, okay, it could, yeah. it's usually, you know, smelling. But so yeah. um, visual field doesn't evoke a fear response yet. And then we bring it back and then we might bring it a little closer. And we're just going to go kind of back and forth as long as it doesn't evoke a fear response. Okay, so yeah. there's that. And then there's counter conditioning, which is purely just feeding, 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 feeding. The thing is, is nearby and we're trying to counter condition. Now, what right, I'm going right. to show you are videos with negative reinforcement and negative okay. reinforcement. And I like to call it non-coercive negative reinforcement because we're okay. staying within that window of where the animal is still like mostly comfortable and we're not evoking that really high stress response. And okay. it might show like a, you're going to see in this video, hopefully it's downloading here. OK, great. Um, you're going to see where he's still kind of like, oh, you know, um, what what's going on there but but as soon as he he still has the opportunity he's still in that threshold of it's not like oh my gosh you know i'm, I'm freaking out, out. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly and and i can control it and especially yeah. and that's where that's where this procedure kind of lives is that i'm controlling how close he actually can get to it and that's what's okay. really really important so i have so many videos of negative reinforcement used in a variety of different ways. So that's what we're going to talk about a little bit um, and how I really like it, it takes kind of a whole environmental setup, but I'll show you kind of this one and then we'll go from there. So okay, let you. me see. Okay, here we go. Um, let me see here. So this was, uh, it could have even just been today, but let's just see here. Um, okay, there we go. All right, you can see this okay? Yep, thank you, I can. Okay, 
So this is uh, one of my ravens. And we knew here, I'm just going to set this up. So we knew that that we gave him something, a novel object, like a novel few objects that we knew he was likely to show this response to because he's been, especially like in the breeding season, he tends to be like a little bit more aware of everything than like, than he just normally is. Okay, and especially makes- like, especially around well, maybe not especially around me, but anyone basically other than Katie, who's the blonde. He just really likes blondes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we always joke about that, but the gentleman prefers blondes. So okay. <laughs> um, so we we kind of set it up gently where we just had a we just had a feeling that that was what we were were going to kind of like be seeing. And we knew that there's a few different items that will evoke a really strong fear response. And that's what we didn't want, but we wanted to set it up where it was just going to have this like really gentle reaction. And so Katie set him down and I set this object down where he was still, as you can see, I'm going to just push it back just a little bit where um, she had him on and you can just kind of see his response here where, um, he's not he's not leaning away okay so we're looking at his body language in all of these um situations so so he's he's coming to me for food but he's not actually particularly hungry at this point because i've already fed him so i remove it because he's showing just relaxed like nothing behavior and then this is the important part i give him a a behavior loop Okay, so the behavior loop is that I don't want to put the object back where it will evoke that strong fear response. So I actually toss a bunch of mealworms away so that he moves away and I can put it back. Okay, that's really important. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, very good. So then I am trying to get it back and he didn't want whatever I had. You can see he's just like, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) So that's when. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. (laughs) And so I, I move it back. And so I'm actually using food and the approach, but um, mostly the important part is the approach or a space, I should say, because I'm removing it. But the mm-hmm. most important part is just um, space. The, and the reason why I'm actually using food is because it is breeding season and I'm, I'm a I'm trying to get him a little bit away from me and b like he's so comfortable that he can get a little bit um just like poundy as some really (laughs) comfortable ravens can do but the most important part is is i'm not just using like straight up food because i can actually show you i think i have it on here um if not i have it somewhere else but i can show you what it looks like if i just use food and it like it doesn't it's not that strong of a thing okay so here we are just just removing it yeah And he's just like, and, and then he shows curious. Yep. Yeah, he's and, making the connection. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, let me get back. Um, I will show you actually what happened right after that uh, because I forgot to. I forgot that it was also on my phone. Let me get it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But I will show you. He was so comfortable that he actually reached in and grabbed something else so it is right here um here we go uh, so but does that make sense that you can see exactly yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. what i am uh what i'm reinforcing with that yeah okay so that's kind of where i would be starting with um the fear response and again like i said that's where we have been really focusing a lot of our attention um we just did like a a parrot screaming challenge and a lot of the issues that people were having with that screaming challenge is is that their parrots were not engaging with their environment kind of you know kind of like your your raven that you're talking about and Mm -hmm. it leads to just like focusing on people specifically in the you know in the home and so that can 
and I'll, and I'll, and I'll draw, I promise I'll draw this back around to why this okay. is relevant. So, um, so pe the parrot is focusing on the people and instead, you know, and that, that leads to a lot of problem behaviors like screaming. And so mm -hmm. when the parrot doesn't have like skills to engage in the environment, that's kind of where they, they focus on the easy stuff and how they know how to push that button. Like, Oh, I, I scream and the person it. does something. So coming back around the we like this bird also doesn't have a lot of skills so what he's actually using is he's using his his fear response to control the environment so right. he's saying okay. okay i can i can show this fear response and then it gets the people around me to to move and and that's not i mean it's not a bad thing it's not like you're you should stay there and say like, nope, I'm not going to move. And you just have to ping pong around. And so we'll kind of talk about exactly um, how we switch that, flip that switch, I should say. And okay. we'll talk about what it looks like to so that we're not just freaking and stressing this bird out because that's not what I'm saying. No, uh, Chris, okay. <laughs> yeah. Chris sh said, um, using negative reinforcement in this way is like magic. I think it's also giving the learner better well welfare during the training session. I mm -hmm. would totally agree. And uh, it, it, it really is because the biggest thing is that we're not trying to use food just to be like here, you know, here, let's just feed you and you'll get over everything just because I'm feeding you. And that's not what we're doing. In fact, we're actually assessing what the animal wants and the animal wants space. So we're giving them what they want out of the situation. Okay. Yes, and, thank you. Uh, Shelly laughed that I said breeding season attention, and that is very true. So, <laughs> um, okay, so let's chit chat a little bit about what that might look like in your situation. So can you give me a scenario where, you know, you're having some some issues, maybe like getting close or bringing something in and what does the bird show in front of you? And and what let, let's workshop that a little bit. Okay, when I put his food out in the morning, I put it down in a, in a dish and put his water and click and leave. If I come back in, he won't, he'll go behind his house. He won't come out and eat while I'm there. Um, if I stand on the outside of his enclosure and watch after a while, he will come out and take something out of this dish and hop up to the top of the, um, the little house in there and start eating in front of me. So he will eat in front of me um, and his favorite treat are, obviously little roadkill or mice um we have a farm so we have mice i set traps and <laughs> and those are his that's like his supreme treat is a mouse so okay. um yeah go ahead no i i know that um i i also uh i on our farm our gophers are our birds like favorite oh, um, yeah. <laughs> so um okay so my question is first of all so you set the food down how do you do you, uh, walk back a little bit? And if you do, how far back? And then also how long do you have to wait before it comes comes out? I, I do. Walk, if I walk back a little bit, it could be I don't know that he would come back with me in out with me in the enclosure. If I shut the gate, the door and stand outside, it's all hardware cloth. So I can he can see me. I can see him. Um, he will come out. But if I'm in there, he won't come out. OK. OK. And it's probably. Perfect six eight feet maybe distance or a little more that i have from him when i put the food down okay and then how long does he usually come out like within a few minutes is that yeah is that usually yes. okay okay so this is i have actually done this exact um training session with our oh, great. hawk eagle so i've done this like two um and where she she did actually get up on my glove within uh just a few weeks so wow um, yeah so I have done this and she was 40 years old. So believe it or not. Oh, that's amazing. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. For so her. you can do this. I believe that you can do this. So this is perfect. So what we want to do is we want to sort of take slices of the behavior that we're looking for. So let's say we want him to eat his whole meal in front of us first. Okay. okay. So yeah. that's kind of like goal number one is, is to eat is to come down and eat in front of us. So if that's the case, then we want for him, we want to be able to reinforce that with space. So what I did, for instance, is mm -hmm. I, um, I like when she would 
fly towards the food, not even just like onto the food, but she would fly towards the food. I would immediately like step away and leave because I knew that's okay. what she wanted. Yep. Yep. So I did that for a few repetitions. I would say, I mean, it, it does depend on your bird and your bird will inform you of what, you know, what is comfortable for them. But mm -hmm. I like I did that for about three or four repetitions and I just left as soon as, as soon as, you know, maybe he hops onto his house or hops onto a perch, you know, it's like, okay, you know, food's there. And then you leave. And he's like, okay, okay. the button of looking at the food is what gets Anne to leave. Got it. Okay. Got it. So yes. once that starts to become fluent and again, that's up to him and up to you. Once that becomes like, he's like, okay, this is the button. And for a Got raven, it. yep. it's probably a lot more, uh, it's a lot quicker than, um, than for a 40 year old ornate hockey goal, but yeah. who knows? Um, <laughs> Then once once that starts to become pretty fluent, then we ask for the next step. So it might be like take, you know, a hop or a step towards that food. It could be that he just moves all the way towards it. it you know, again, I'm relying on on you. You've got some skills underneath you, obviously, mm -hmm. but he could just leap forward. Who knows? But you're looking for that next step and then you move very quickly. That's where the click could come in very handy. I did yeah. bridge. Okay. I use a verbal bridge most, um, I won't say most, but a lot of bird people, because we've got one hand, you know, busy and the yes. other hand feeding, <laughs> we do. Um, but a click could be very, very helpful. So, okay. um, you know, click retreat. And again, there's your fluency that you're looking for is, yep. is looking for that. And then, you know, once, um, you know, once, so then we start, you know, looking for those approximations towards the food bowl, you will see, like, if you see what I call kind of um, grab and go or dine and dash behaviors. Mm -hmm. So uh, ravens are really good at like, um, they have their weight centered back so he'll he'll kind of be like this and if mm -hmm. you see that we're not quite ready to move forward so okay. you want him to be really really comfortable and you want that kind of like relaxed body language before you move forward ravens are really really good at being like nope you know and, nope. and kind of yep. like um <laughs> you know doing that kind of snatchy behavior so we're looking for um just you know comfortable duration um, nice, calm body language before we ask for a little bit more. Okay. And then, um, and then he'll come to that food. So once he gets to that food, what I would recommend from there is to ask for you to be able to come closer and closer. So that looks like a few, it could look like a few different things, I guess. So in a lot of those cases, I like to start advancing and like really slowly. And then he might alert, you know, like he, he's got his head, his little, little raven head down into his food. He might look up. And then as soon as I see the slightest indication of relaxed behavior, so it could just be, he, he just has to look down at his food. He doesn't even have to take another bit at first, he just has to like take his attention off of me. That's when I bail and I leave. So okay. those are the those are the levels of approximations that I'm. Okay, that's for. great. Yeah, oh, it's good. fun. It's really yeah. really fun. Yeah, I I'm, have just. I'm, well, I just want to say I have to put this on hold just a little bit. I just recently had a back injury and I can't do anything yet. But I'm taking all these notes and I can't wait to get out there. Thank you so much. This is so great. Yeah. So that's really, I mean, that's really where I would start. And okay. I think that's a really good place, you know, to be able to get to, to get up towards, you know, the, the food. And like I said, with the ornate hockey goal, I used that exact method and it took me, I want to say, well, we had a little, we had to do a, a medical procedure in the middle of it. So we had to, oh, to yeah. grab her up twice because she only had one eye. So oh, um, we, we, you know, we had a little bit of bump in the middle, but even still, it only took us like two months before she was stepping up onto our glove. And that's a 40 year old amazing. bird. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. Oh, so, so much. It's, it's so great. This is exciting. I'm really excited and just really enriching. Like Chris said, that it's a really enriching procedure to be able to to see the bird kind of come around and and to be able to understand they see like oh my gosh i am controlling this person's yes. distance yes. from me for once 
And, you know, it's just one of those things where we're really changing kind of the rules a little bit of, of what choice means. And I was just going to say, and giving them a choice to do what they want to do, feeling safe about it. I love that about this type of training. I mean, that's what we do it. Yeah. They have a choice. Literally just today. So I was mentioning uh, what I was telling one of my staff members today. So we have a bird that has had to be grabbed and restrained for medical procedures for like the past six weeks. And so we had to, so she, I've had, you know, she, I've had her for 10 years. I have a very strong relationship with her, but with my other trainers, you know, it's, it's that, that long lasting relationship just isn't there. And so she just sure. doesn't have as much trust with them. So one of the trainers needed to get her and weigh her to check in on her weight this morning. And she got out of her hospital cage. And so she's, you know, flying around and my trainer comes up to me and says, I can't get her. And I was like, you can get her, you know, like, I promise you, you can get her. And she's like, well, she's going to get exhausted. She's going to, you know, I'm going to have to chase her around. And I was like, no, no, no. And we used negative reinforcement. We reinforced all of these small steps. And, you know, when she was showing us like go away behaviors, we just stayed there. And anytime she showed us like calmness, then Mm -hmm. we retreated and she got her within five minutes. Like she was crying and I was like, I believed in you and you didn't believe in you. So it was amazing. Yeah. Chris says, I love that example. It's true. And I don't even have it on video. I was like, Oh yeah. So it really, really does work. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Thank you so very much. All of you. I'm not that um, what's the word? I don't know about Zoom so much, so I haven't been responding to anybody, but I really appreciate um, the feedback and uh, the help so much. I appreciate yeah. it. And I will keep in touch and let you know how it awesome. goes. Awesome. Well, awesome. Right. Well, thanks so much for being part of this. And I'm really, really excited uh, to hear how everything goes. My pleasure. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Shelly said, please keep in touch and update. This platform, I'm a parent owner, but appreciate the Corvid exercise and love the Corvid owner's loving attitude. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank I you think much. so too. Awesome. <laughs> thank you all. Great. This was so lovely. And it was just a, a, it was a wonderful example. And I look forward to, I hope your back feels better. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all.